Condominiums have, for many people in this province, become not just starter homes, but lifelong homes. That often means vertical neighborhoods and sharing amenities and services. It also means a condo board overseeing it all, managing competing interests in very close quarters. How well do those boards do at finding the balance? Let's find out from Audrey McGuire. She's president of the Association of Condominium Managers of Ontario and regional director for First Service Residential. Megan Mackey is here. She's a partner at Shibley Wrighton LLP. And Holland Marshall, whose website condomadness.info provides information about condo ownership. And I am delighted to welcome three rookies of television here tonight. <laughs> First timers Thank you. all. That's really nice. Well, Thank there has you. been a great deal of talk lately about how condos are being run. This city, of course, is overrun by condominiums right now. Overrun's probably not the word you would like me to use, but there's a lot going on. A lot of issues around whether to ban cannabis use, ban pets, ban Airbnb. Uh, somebody threw a chair off a condo the other day, and that got some attention too. Anyway, there's a new book by University of Windsor professor Randy Lippert who had this to say about how condos are governed. Sheldon, if you would. Condominiums are like sausages. They are made, sold, consumed everywhere in cities, and with little fanfare or sophistication, promise to efficiently satisfy a need. But like sausages, little is known about condo innards, and the less one knows, the better off one may feel. The inner workings and governance of condos remains either a distasteful topic due to imagined conflict, acrimony, or dreariness, or a minor urban mystery. There is little appreciation of how condo governance works, the knowledge it requires, or of how it is mutating and might be set free from its conquerors. That's Randy Lippert in Condo Conquest this year. Now, let's just start with this. Audrey, to you first. When people say condo, they often think 40 stories, gleaming glass windows, downtown Toronto. Is that accurate? I would say accurate. Um, in the industry, you know, we have evolved somewhat with condominiums. Um, we refer to in this industry, as I'm sure our guest speakers here can attain to, is our three things are people, pets, and parking. Okay, but now we have to add people, pets, parking, and pot. <laughs> so we have a lot of issues that we have to deal with, is that the perception of what people believe a condo basically is. I would agree with that, but it's what goes on behind the doors and how it's governed is really the key components of condominiums. And we're going to get to that. But Megan, again, 40-story gleaming towers is not the whole story, right? There's other stuff as well. There are a lot of different kinds of condos. Certainly we're familiar with the gleaming towers along the waterfront. But on top of that, there are townhouse condominium corporations. There are low rise. You can also get malls, which are actually condominiums where each shop is its own unit. There are industrial condos and also vacant land condos. Some of the gated communities where the common elements are the roads and everyone pays for the gate, but their own lot is uh, owned and they can build whatever they want on it. Under Ontario law, what is a condominium actually? A condominium is, uh, is a form of property ownership. So uh, before condominiums existed, if you wanted to buy a home, you would buy a parcel of land which would have a dwelling on it. But when you buy a condominium, it's a legal structure under which you actually buy two things. You buy your own unit, which could be an apartment or a townhouse, and then you buy an interest in what is called the common elements. So everyone owns a percentage of their doors, their windows, their driveways, their parking garage. But the main difference is with the decision making. If you own your own home, which we call freehold, you get to decide when to do the repairs, you get to decide if you're gonna allow pot smoking in your home. But in a condominium, it's the board of directors which gets to make those decisions. And that takes me to Holland. What does a condo board do? Tell us about the whole nine yards. Well, it depends on the building. I, I've listed about almost 20 different kinds of condominiums. And if you get a, a most people believe that it would be a residential a building or residential townhouses, where it's people who live in these buildings and they get together and they make the decisions. But quite often you'll have a building where you have retail stores. You'll have maybe a condominium offices and then you have one or two towers. And all of the decision making then gets broken down to who controls the board. 
Is it the residence? Is it the uh, retail? Is it the office compound? Is there, is there a single answer to that question? No, there isn't. No. Hmm. There's 10,000 condos in Ontario, and there's 10,000 different ways they're run. <laughs> Not, no two are really the same. And what, uh, can you give us a, a sort of a, uh, a sense of the broad, vast, different kinds of issues that condo boards have to deal with? So first of all, your board of directors um, is a volunteer position. And I think, you know, most residents actually forget that. So they're dedicating their time. Nobody gets paid, eh, to be on the condo no. board? Well, there are a few that do. <clears throat> and um, Megan can um, agree with me there. Some of them do have some monetary. They will be paid for each meeting they attend or whatever's written in their bylaws, actually. <laughs> but very few, in my experience, actually, are paid for being uh, on a board of directors. Then you have the residents, and keep in mind the residents are their neighbours if they live on site, which mm -hmm. we refer to as owner-occupied. So you have the residents, <clears throat> the board of directors, and then we bring in the manager. So the manager basically as in is... the property management the company. The property management company yeah. is basically, in my opinion, is the glue. Because someone has to take control to ensure that the daily tasks of the building operations are conducted on a daily basis. But with that, there comes personality conflicts. <laughs> we have dysfunctional boards. We have, unfortunately, boards with sometimes their own agendas. But we do have a lot of professional boards as well that are there for the right reasons and they're there to protect their biggest investment as most homeowners. It's, it's Megan, it's a little confusing because, you know, take the province of Ontario. It's pretty obvious who's in charge. The premier's in charge. This is a mini government of a kind. But it's less clear to me who's in charge. Is it the property management company? Is it the condo board of directors? Is it the residents ultimately um, to whom everybody is allegedly uh, paying service to? What's the answer there? Well, we actually refer to condominiums as a fourth level of government, and it operates very much like the province. Every unit owner gets a vote and they elect the board of the directors. And it's the board who makes the decisions and gets to control everything. So now, they're like cabinet in a way. They're like the cabinet. Uh, and it's, it's not like the premier who may have greater powers. Each member of the board of directors gets one equal vote. And, uh, it, you know, management is very important. If you have a good management company, they can provide good advice to the board and they can keep an eye on things that should be watched. Ultimately, it is the board which can hire and terminate the management companies. So if, if there's a manager and they're not doing their job, it's up to the board to change that. Do you agree, Holland, with this analogy that uh, condo boards are like a fourth level of government in the province? Well, there's, it's a partially a, that, that definition does it work about half of it. But it's also, when you're joining a condo, it's like joining a club. There's tennis clubs, there's uh, the granite club, there's motorcycle clubs. They all have bylaws, they all have rules, and they all have uh, monthly dues or monthly expenses. And it depends on, do you fit into what that club, uh, its, it's uh, culture, its uh, goals, and what, what it makes it run. And if you don't, then what? Sell and get out. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. And just confirming, do you belong to a motorcycle club? Uh, no. Because that's an interesting <laughs> example that you picked there. Okay. But, you know, a club is a club is a club, but a condo is a condo is a condo. I and, get you, but there's... a little uh, different. Okay. Uh, Audrey, help me with this then. If, if, if people don't like the job the Premier's doing, they can vote against the Premier and try and get rid of the Premier. That's correct. Can you do the same thing in a condo? Absolutely. What you can do is you can... The homeowners can requisition the meeting um, to remove board members. However, 50% plus one, there's lots of politics involved there. Um, and sometimes it can be very difficult. And sometimes the same board can be reappointed in very strange circumstances, huh. depending on proxies and so forth. So it's, um, it's an official guideline that you have to go through, hold a meeting officially, voting, you know, democratic vote and so forth. But it can be very difficult. And that's when you can run into a lot of problems. Going back to previously, board of directors, if they're living in their community, Holland had expressed about um, clubs and for so forth. What a lot of people don't understand is they have actually bought into a community with rules and regulations. Hmm. And people don't like rules for the most part. And I think it's an educational thing where they're not really 
educated enough to know what they've actually purchased. Okay, if on the other hand, Megan, if you think a if you think the board's gone rogue, how easy is it to get rid of them? Well, uh, like Audrey was saying, you can effectively impeach the board. Uh, you need uh, a certain percentage of the owners to requisition a meeting. And then you need 50% of voting units to vote in favour of the impeachment. And 50% doesn't sound too high, but what we see particularly in the glass towers downtown uh, is owner apathy. They buy these condominium units, they don't uh, pay any attention to what goes on. So getting 50% of the owners to actually pay attention to what's going on in, in the condominium can be really challenging. Uh, the Globe and Mail had a story this week about condos that are, now this is very different, I had not heard about this before. They want their condo residents to have their dog's DNA registered. So if the condo management company, for example, finds some poop that has not been scooped, they can actually test the poop, mm -hmm. compare it to the registry of dog DNA, figure out whose dog it was, and then nab the owner. Is that legal? Certainly. It is, uh, eh? And, you know, that came in uh, to Florida maybe a decade ago, I recall reading about this. And in Florida, apparently they had problems with people not picking up after their dogs. Those condominiums that implemented this type of system, apparently the problem just evaporated overnight. So once I they think put it, the registry in place. Yes, once they put the <laughs> registry, all of a sudden uh, they didn't seem to find any more dog uh, mess lying around. No one wants to be named and shamed that way. <laughs> no. Gotcha. And if I may comment Please. on that too, it does make a big difference because it attracts rodents. It attracts so many things. It brings down the value of the property. And, you know, like you said, it's really hard to find out who the owner is without that DNA. Years ago, uh, in a building that I managed many years ago, I won't say where, we had a picture day for the dogs. And I'm talking probably about 12 years ago, where we took a picture of the dog and we weighed the dog so that when little um, Sasha passed away, uh, if they were grandfathered, there would be no new little Sasha coming ah, on board. See, so they're, they're sneaky, you know, they, okay. they, they try to but get away with it. Holland, tell me, I get it. I get why pooping and scooping would be an issue in, in, in particularly in a, in a very urban setting. I, I, is it awkward to go to a new condo purchaser and say, I'm afraid I'm gonna need some DNA from your dog because we're putting it in a registry to make sure that you scoop your dog's poop? You be, see, I guess they can do it. I, I have trouble with it myself. I mean, I think in condos, you should go with cats, right? You know, cats are, uh, are an apartment pet. They're a little Dogs more are a little more difficult. Yeah. But um, the other thing is people think that I own my castle. You can't come, nobody can come into my unit. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I have full privacy and all that. It's not so. Who can get in? Uh, once a year, the uh, fire inspectors come, uh, uh, company comes in to check to see if your smoke uh, detector works and the, and the alarm works. Can the property management company come in? At times, yes, they Whenever can. Whenever they want? If there's a water leak. Oh, okay. Uh, if there is um, the inspecting, inspecting huh. the, uh, the uh, balconies, uh, doing maintenance on, on the air conditioning, uh, heating systems. How about members of the board? Can they have access? Uh, normally they don't because that's just a little awkward. But the property manager can come in at, or the superintendent if there's an emergency, which is water, water leak, fire, hmm. uh, something along, uh, safety issues. But other than that, they give you a 48, 24 hours notice and say, or 48 hours notice and say, hey, we're coming in and we're going to be doing such, such and maintenance. there's nothing you can do about that? Nope. And okay. this is where having a good management company is important to control this access. But there are some condominiums which are self-managed. And when it comes time to investigating sudden water leaks, it sometimes can be the board members going through their neighbor's units. Self-managed, meaning the members of the, like the people who live there do it themselves? The condominium directors act as property managers. Really? And we see that more commonly in very small condominiums, if maybe there's two or four units. But there are some, we have some larger clients which uh, are self-managed. Audrey, I would assume that there, like being a property management, being a property management for a condominium, particularly if it's a big, you know, 100, 200, 300 unit, that's a lot of work. Can, can buildings that big self-manage? Um, my personal opinion on that would be it's not their best option. I would definitely encourage them to go to a professional management company. 
Um, now that's your business, we have to say. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. That's just. But I would um, agree with her. You yes, agree. yes, because it depend. It really depends on the board of directors and their background. You know what they're familiar with, especially the financial aspect of it. I mean, unfortunately, lots of board members are coerced into positions that they don't want to be because no one else will run. Hmm. And then you all of a sudden have a treasurer who's overseen a four million dollar budget who's never even seen a financial statement. So hmm. it can be very, it really depends. We have a lot of good professional boards out there, but there's also a lot of boards that have never served on a board before. Give us a sense of the money. If, you, if you've got, let's say it's a 100 unit condominium mm -hmm. building, what are you looking at to hire a property management company to take care of the place for you? Well, that would be giving away some trade secrets. Well, give them um, away, what the heck? So for 100, depending what type, because you have so many different types, right? If it's a common element, it could be, you know, like, maybe $20 a door and that's, you know, it just depends what's involved. If there's a shared facility, uh, which is a big part of it these days, it really depends. Mm -hmm. Every condominium is really unique, but the cost will be a lot higher, I believe, if you don't have a professional management company. I would say about $30, $35 per unit for a regular, for a resi for a regular residential yeah. unit. Uh, I've seen it as high as 70, but that's yes. really a high end. way, way too high. Okay. And again, uh, I hate to push this metaphor too far, but again, if this is like a, a, a fourth level of government in the province, for example, um, you know, when I go down to Queen's Park and watch Question Period, there is a lot of conflict there. So I want to focus on the conflict. What kinds of things, what kinds of conflicts arise in the world of condominiums? Well, I'd like to say we've seen it all, but uh, <laughs> things come up all the time which we haven't seen before. You can have members of the board, Audrey mentioned dysfunctional boards, you can have members of the boards have a conflict with each other. Typically we see conflict between unit owners if you have uh, residents that cause a lot of noise or that don't follow the rules. But there are also conflicts between corporations. If you have two towers, which are separate corporations, but they share facilities, mm. that can be uh, a source of conflict. And there are some developments downtown Toronto which are mixed use. There may be a hotel with a condominium, with a commercial area, a parking garage, and those can cause uh, conflict depending on the voting rights and depending on the priorities of the different components. Governments and opposition parties fight over taxes. Right. Condominiums have fees, which are like their taxes. Uh, Holland, tell me this. How often do you get into a conflict on the board where somebody wants to raise taxes slash fees because they want to provide more amenities for more people versus those who just want to say, keep my taxes slash fees as low as possible. I don't care about common element things. In, in far too many condominiums, if you want to get elected, you want to win or you want to stay in office, say, I will not raise your fees. And by gosh, that is a vote catcher. It is very, very hard to fight against someone who says, uh, I won't raise your fees or I won't raise them for higher than 2% a year. No matter what our problems are, no matter how bad the garage is, no matter how much your, the place leaks, no matter what it is, I won't raise your fees. And it works. It works in condos. It works. Is it in... an irresponsible promise to make, though? Of course. Oh, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> well, look at the city of Toronto, right? Go ahead. Well, you know, you got. Uh, we won't raise your fact ta your uh, taxes of more than the, the rate of inflation. But the, the streets are shot. The uh, sewers are gone. The TTC is, you know, starting to really, really look pretty disastrous. So, and you know, look at the sidewalks after our snowfalls. You don't pay taxes, you don't get services. You do that long enough, and before you know it, you're sliding down. So Audrey, it's like government, you get what you pay for? Absolutely, you get what you pay for, because at the end of the day, you know, everything goes up. Nothing comes down in price, and if you want good quality, even utilities, utilities are a significant percentage in a budget, sometimes 35, 40% hmm. of an entire budget, if it's bulk. And it can be, but going back to Holland's comment, if someone stands up and says, you know, we will not raise your fees, that's, you can guarantee the room is um, cheering for that individual. And how often will they get through, if, for example, mm -hmm. something happens, right? right? Let's say there's an earthquake and you gotta fix the parking garage or something mm -hmm. crazy like that. And suddenly everybody's gotta pay a special allotment or fees have gotta go up 10, to, 20%. Yes. Special assessment, that's special a swear assessment. word in our industry. Yes. Okay. Two words. How often do you get thrown off the board as a director if you have to go back on your word about not raising fees. You know what, it, it does happen, but again, you know, when you're affecting people's pocket, 
more so than other, they probably would be um, removed. But going back to Megan's point that we chatted about earlier, it's not that easy to, even still with someone like that, it's still really hard to move them because, you know, we have a hard enough time obtaining quorum at meetings, you know, even to get that 50% to uh, remove that director. But usually I would say for someone that's promised, it's Holland's comment, that they're going to uh, keep the fees and then they have a special assessment, I would say the chances are very high they're going to be removed. Can I just understand that about quorum? Do you, do, do, a majority of the directors have to show up for every meeting or the meeting is not legit, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and quorum, if, if it's a three-person board, quorum would usually be two directors. If it's a five-person uh, board, you'd want uh, three. But uh, Audrey was speaking about even to have an owner's meeting to vote directors in, you need a certain percentage of the owners, usually 25%, to show up. And even it can be a problem getting 25% of owners to be there either by person or in proxy. Why? Because people just don't care, Steve. They just they, they, they buy their well, unit. That's, that's and, just part of it. If, yeah. if you have a, a majority, like in my building, is ninety percent owner occupied. We don't have a problem getting people to the meetings. But if you're in a building downtown and some of these large ones where you got eighty percent, ninety percent of the units are either rented or they're used as short-term hotel rooms, there is nobody in in the building that. You don't have quorum in the building. Because they don't have a piece and, of the action. And, and the people who own these things could be all over the world. Hmm. And they have a management company here looking after it for them, or a real estate agent looking after it for them. So you're not going to get in touch with them. Can I ask you, uh, Megan, do you think it's a problem when, now you said what, 80 to 90 percent of the so, people that's the worst owner cases. occupied? Yeah, but they're there. Okay. I, is it a problem in a condominium when most of the people who live there actually are not the owners of the units they're in? We see a lot of problems in the buildings. A lot of them are in the downtown area. You get a transient population. Sometimes it's short-term rentals, and it becomes a big problem because tenants usually don't take care of the building like owners would, and they don't care if they're moving in six months. Uh, some, some of the behaviors we've seen have been pretty shocking. Go ahead, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you hear stories, uh, particularly with the short-term rentals, massive parties, 30 young people, you know, vomiting in the hallway, things going on in the stairwells. And meanwhile, you could have someone next door who's spent $600,000 to buy a home that they live in, and they're living next to this. And it uh, certainly temperatures uh, rise. Okay, so what repercussions? Or, or, um, what tools does the person who actually lives there and for whom it is home what tools do they have to take on a neighbor who is clearly being flagrant and irresponsible? Well, it's actually the condominium corporation and the condominium board who is responsible for enforcing the rules and for keeping everyone in line. So if your neighbor is short-term leasing and it's causing a lot of problem, you report it to your, usually the condominium manager, who is then tasked with enforcement and dealing all of this. And if, if your board doesn't want to spend the money to engage counsel or if management is overrun with all sorts of other problems, these don't get addressed in a timely manner and it uh, certainly causes a lot of trouble. Now we know in an apartment building who's responsible for knocking on the door and saying, hey, you're making too much noise. Who's responsible for doing it in a condo where everybody theoretically is the owner? It basically would go back to the management and they would generally issue a letter. Uh, yeah, but first they don't letter. live there, right? Well, no, it would go to the owner. The actual letter would go to the owner with a copy to the tenant. So the owner who is on titled, uh, on de deeded on title, would be still responsible for their unit. And then we would call Megan if it didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, is this how you get a lot of business? It certainly is, of yeah. course, yeah. Um, some of the disputes uh, where tenants, I have one right now where it's a tenant who, uh, a lot of late night parties, high heel shoes on a hardwood floor, and uh, the the particular owner would ignore the manager and for years would say, oh, it's she's looking after it, referring to the tenant. So finally, we started a legal proceeding, and that got everyone's notice. And I think it's only because the legal fees ultimately may be paid by the unit owner, and that's why the owner finally then stepped up to try yeah, and evict take the an tenant. Yeah. Take an interest. Okay, but so we're, we're hearing a few horror stories here, but but which are very intriguing and interesting, but Holland, generally speaking, would you say the majority of the condominium association boards in this province do a decent job at fulfilling their responsibilities? They do a reason, they do, as far as we know, they're doing okay. 
Everybody's doing okay. Are they wonderful? Could they be better? Of course. Could it be a lot of them? Could it be worse? Of course. Because at the end of it, condominiums have to work for the majority of people. And if they don't, we wouldn't be buying them. It's not, you know, it's like you hear all these problems with Airbnb, you hear problems with uh, uh, renters and, and condos, but generally speaking, they're rare. You know, you don't get chairs thrown off the uh, balconies every day. Not every day, thank you. And, no. and one condo wasn't that crazy? I know, that was absolutely crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, one condo I know there was a renter, and if he got, if anybody got security or somebody upset him, he'd go and take the fire extinguisher and drop it down the uh, the garbage chute. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible, crazy things can happen, but it's so rare. Okay, but we know in an apartment building, for example, if if, if a tenant behaves badly all the time. You know, the landlord can, there, there's a process to undergo to throw them out. Mm -hmm. If you're a unit owner, can the condo board throw you out? No. Well, and it, it, okay, here what they'll do is they'll, they will basically send you a couple letters, then you'll get a lawyer's letter. The first lawyer's letter is about $600, $800, and the next one will be about $1,300, $1,400, and then we're starting to talk a couple of thousand, and then an hmm. application to court, 10000 20000 I've seen it, I've seen an owner get hit with $40,000 because his tenant was acting up. Did that get their attention? Oh, gosh. Then he had to hire a lawyer. <laughs> so the owner had to hire a lawyer to go after his tenant <laughs> and to try and make a deal with the, with the uh, condo. You know, and then he had, oh, it was just a horror show. <laughs> so I think the, the owner himself was sixty seventy thousand dollars in, in fees because he had a tenant who was out of control. And Megan is wondering, why is that a problem exactly? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, never mind. Um, let's try this. Are going. Ding, 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 ding. A few years ago, the previous Liberal government of the province updated Ontario's condo rules. They created three things in particular. A licensing program for property managers, mandatory training for condo board members, and the Condominium Authority of Ontario um, to help settle disputes more efficiently. Can you... we just got a couple minutes left here. Is that working? Is that doing a better job at smoothing things out? I certainly think it is, especially when it comes to what I deal with, uh, the dispute resolution. Uh, one of the frequent sources of complaints were that unit owners couldn't get their records from the condominium corporation, which they're entitled to see. And previously, you had to go to court to get those. So the condominium authority has created a tribunal, which just currently deals with records requests. And I find it's much more efficient, it's faster. If the owner's entitled to the records, the boards are now handing it over, hand, handing the records over. And when the owner is not entitled to something, there's finally someone to say right away, you can't have that. Hmm. So uh, that's been great. Audrey, last 30 seconds to you. How well is the new system working? Um, I think it's definitely evolving. I think licensing, if I may speak to that, um, is definitely raising the bar for professionalism in the industry. Um, we have come a long way. Licensing has basically made managers now hot commodities. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's about 11,000 and change condos and, you know, there's maybe only, I think, less than 3,000 total general limited licensees. And if they have their designation as a registered condominium manager, there's maybe, I believe, up to close to 1,100 with 11,000 mm -hmm. condominiums. I was going to say, from what I'm told, one out of every nine Ontarians lives in a condo now which basically big. means this is a big issue and getting bigger as we see more and more condos going up. I want to thank everybody for uh, helping us out with this one here. Megan Mackey, who is with Shibley Wright and LLP. Holland Marshall, you can find out more on his website, condomadness.info. And Audrey McGuire from the Association of Condominium Managers of Ontario. Great job, everybody. Thanks very thank much. You. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.